So I'm really um, super excited to speak to you today, Julia, and uh, for the Paradigm Shifter series for NYU Skirball, uh, with which, you, of course, you are very familiar as a performer and composer in New York City. Um, so first of all, thank you for joining us today. Oh, thank you for having me. <laughs> and, and Julia, if, if I can, I'll introduce you for a moment and that'll... Um, and then I, I'll, I'll ask you for one favor, which is that you'll indulge me because I'm not a, a music expert. Um, That's good. And, no one should uh, be a music expert. And, but, but I have to say, I want to start out. I wrote this in an email. So I try to listen to as much of your music as I can. And I did this in the last couple of weeks, really walking through Manhattan at night because I take these walks because there's not much else to do. And the experience of being immersed in these sound worlds it was i literally stopped sometimes and sort of in lower manhattan where it's very empty right now and it has its own kind of melancholic but also this kind of openness but it's so incredibly moving some of the pieces were so moving i mean thank you <laughs> i wanted and and so maybe i'll just introduce our listeners i love that the thought of you walking in oh outdoors and i mean it's just an interesting way to listen it's you know because listening is its own phenomenon where you are and what you're doing and this is the moment of, of how you heard it you know it's and, interesting and the walking kind of the the physical sensation of just walking because your your music can be very propulsive and kind of driving and this it has these rhythms and these kind of sort of surfaces of rhythm and then they sort of subside and they ebb and then crush, there's a like grow it's really kind of it was a nice way of experiencing it i think rather than sitting in a chair right. <laughs> yeah, so. it, become, it becomes your your film score or something in a way it's right right exactly so for just our listeners and why we wanted to talk to you today so you are um of course, one of the great American contemporary composers has been recognized. You've won a Pulitzer Prize. You've been awarded with a MacArthur Genius Grant, which was wonderful. It gives you some space to think and be creative, kind of a liberating award. And um, some of the pieces I think that people have probably encountered are maybe the starting with the recent one, Fire in My Mouth, which I would love to talk about a bit because it's also inspired by a location here in New York City in Greenwich Village, as we know. Uh, Anthracite Fields, which we talked about years ago and we won some committee and you were just starting out then. Right, right, yeah. Doing research oh, yeah. On, on these coal miners in, in Pennsylvania. Um, and then some of the other works you've done, um, with Bang on a Can, where your co-founder and artistic directors really take classical music into a completely new space, I think. And I think the great thing is that you've probably brought an enormous amount of listeners into spaces where they really hadn't felt they would be comfortable or welcome. But that's, we really wanted to do that. I mean, just to feel like we had such an incredible experience with music. Um, why can't we share that? And, you know, it, it might be not mainstream listening, but it, it, it's such a powerful experience. So, so many, so many great pieces of music give you that experience. And we just thought, let's invite people in, you know, just a more inviting in so that it's a, a bigger conversation. And and you've done with, with Bang on a Can, which the name already says, it's, it, it, it gets you involved from the get-go. It's pretty dramatic. It's, it's sort of music front and center, but it's a collaboration, right? And you're the co-founder and artist and co-artistic director. You're a founder, but it's about working together as a group. I, it seems to me a kind of also a social experiment. Oh, oh, definitely. And also, you know, artists can often be so isolated. Um, you know, visual artists can have collaborators, but um, you you can exist in your studio by yourself. You're not necessarily dependent on other people. Um, I don't know if that's true for, for all art, but certainly a writer can be very solitary, a poet. Um, it's also a writer, obviously, but um, 
but a musician generally needs other people. They, they, they usually need other people. I mean, you can write electronic music and we're completely on the computer, but most of us interface with musicians. So um, that's good for me because I'm a very social <laughs> being. Um, and I think that so there is already this sort of natural collective sense when you're in music. But, um, but this organization, Bang in a Can, which really is a very irreverent name, very intentionally irreverent, um, uh, really is a home base. It, it, it's a community for me in, in, in the midst of this crazy world. It's a, a wonderful kind of oasis in, in a way. And as a composer, when you see yourself, it's, it is to think of collaboration because you are probably in your study or wherever you are, you're composing these things. And I, I, I'm just imagining, do you, do you actually start to imagine when you're writing and when you're thinking of pieces, how they would play out with all these different people involved? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I'm often the audience when I'm writing. Okay. Uh, and I don't write for the audience because I have no idea who's going to be sitting there, what they're going to like. I, ha I have to... I have to be the judge of what's moving or you know, has to move me or has to mean something to me. And then there's the hope it will mean something to someone else. Um, but um, a lot of times you kind of, I at least consciously create that distance. So I'll, I'll be working on a piece, sometimes on the piano, which is behind me, or, um, or on the laptop. Um, and I'll go, okay, I'm walking in. I'm sitting down. I actually go through this process. I'm sitting down. And it starts, you know, certainly for the beginning of a piece. What what's my lead in or what's my what are my words or my musical words that I'm trying to say? And I'll go through it as if I'm a listener. I think I guess in a certain sense, all composers are heavy duty listeners. They're always listening to what they're creating as they're imagining it, um, whether it's actually physically listening to it or imagining the listening. Um, but there's, in a certain sense, you're like a perpetual audience as a, as a composer. And what do you think happens to an audience member once they settle in and sit down, once we're all back to like performance and there's something about you go through your daily life and then you listen in it. I think, I mean, I was brought up very much with classical music as a reverential moment. It's like going to church or temple, you sit down and then you're really, really super quiet. And now something is going to happen and it's different from the time before. Yeah, it is. It is a kind of sacred space in a way. I mean, it's outside of, um, well, certainly if it's a live concert, which is what we're all looking forward to getting back to, um, it's outside of your normal daily mundane living. This is my mundane living. So uh, you suddenly have this opportunity to be transported. And and if it's a great piece or a great moment, you just allow yourself to to go there. I mean, that said, sometimes there are, are formalities with concert presentation that we've, we've as, a, as an organization, certainly Bang in a Can is challenged. Like, do we need that formality? You know, um, do we need to let people move around or do we need to have a different kind of space or do we need to have a, a lighting or something, something that changes our habitual mode of listening to concerts? But that said, I think even in a very conventional setting, it still is a kind of escape in the best sense of the word. It's a way to to be transported and to be um, to be touched, really, to be moved. Yeah. It's interesting. I uh, I talked to Richard Schechner a couple of weeks ago, who, of course, also said, "Where does the performance end, and where do we start? We're performing ourselves." But when you just said you enter into a space, the two pieces I listened to quite a lot over the last couple of weeks is Anthracite Fields and Fire in My Mouth, and they're they're very distinct spaces that you're recreating. The coal mines in Pennsylvania and the sweatshop in early 20th century America. So there's also something about people going into a place to work and then they're subjected to certain rhythms and behaviors. It's not the sacred space of a performance. But I, I'm curious, maybe we can talk either one of those pieces, but you do actually recreate a bit of an experience of being in a particular sound space. Yeah, I mean, with those pieces, for sure they're they're very much based in history and in, and in, in environments and and that was fascinating because i i don't know those environments firsthand or i didn't know those environments firsthand um so especially let's say we look at anthracite fields to literally go down into the coal mines i, I think i must have gone i went down three times um you can actually go on a tour you go to this 
there's a little uh, museum that's an amazing museum actually in Scranton, Pennsylvania that depicts everything about life in the 20th century related to mining in, the, in that region. And they have outside, there's this track that goes down into the ground, this little cart. Um, most of the tours are led by retired miners. Um, they, they're, ch they're school children going down on these things or, or just visitors. And um, it's not for everybody. If you're claustrophobic, I don't recommend it, but you get into the cart and you, you have some protective gear, not, not a lot, but, and you go down these tracks into the mine and uh, all of a sudden it is so dark, you know, the, the darkest environment I've ever been in. Um, there's actually one moment where the, the uh, tour guide that we had said, well, let me show you really how dark it is. And he switched off any of the kind of ex extra light lighting so that you could see where you were. And it's completely black. And I had never seen anything that dark before. Just, there's no light at all coming in from anywhere. Um, so that's a pretty dramatic experience. And, um, and you know, it's always tricky to put your, yourself in someone else's shoes, but I tried to get as close as I could, at least see what the environment looked like, talk to the people who worked there and what that experience was like and um, read a lot about it and try to understand it and um, become a, a part of it in a way. I mean, not, I obviously I, I don't, that's not my work environment. <laughs> my work environment is a nice, lovely little studio here in New York. Um, but that's also was an interesting thing because I'm from a small town in Pennsylvania. Um, just uh, south of this region. And when I went to kind of introduce myself to this community, um, I let them know that, you know, it would have been fine if I was a New Yorker from birth, totally fine. I could be a city slicker, but I actually wanted them to, to know somehow it was part of my connection to them. I was saying, you know, oh, I grew up near here. My grandmother grew up in Scranton. Um, and so uh, just to diffuse any idea that I'm some outsider, you know, an artist coming in and kind of just wanting to make some piece about these people. But I, I really wanted to listen, you know, go there, uh, be low key, but just hear what they had to tell me as opposed to coming in with any preconceived ideas. So, so that was a really wonderful experience to just go and uh, there's so many stories related to people <laughs> telling me those stories, but I, I loved that experience of just let me go see what do they have to tell me. And, and families of minors, so, so you talk to people who have generations of minors in their families? Yeah, so a bunch of the, the I guess I mentioned a bunch of the tour guides that are connected to this small museum. It's called, it's called the Anthracite Heritage Museum, so it's just outside of the city of Scranton. Uh, I guess technically in Scranton, but not in downtown. And um, so uh, the curator there, um, the museum curator, uh, was able to connect me to certain people. But then I was literally in the gift shop because um, I went through the whole exhibit, which is amazing, amazing. They have everything, the tools, the newspaper articles, all the political issues, all the labor issues, the uh, simulation of the wash house. I mean, everything was there. Um, but I just, I'm just i milling through the gift shop because they're interesting books and I like gift shops. <laughs> I love museum gift shops. So there I am looking at little figurines of coal. And um, this woman who's working behind the cashier says, I heard you're, you're um, writing about coal mining. You're writing about this community. I have a lot of stories. And I said, oh, really? Well, what, what, what are your stories? She said, well, I've been writing about my life forever. And she had, literally, I wound up getting together with her, this is Barb, um, she had like a stack of writing. I didn't use any of the text that she had written, but I learned all about her life. She grew up in a patch town. Um, the patch towns were the towns that the company built. You know, you hear this expression, the company store, where they really did have a company store. So the company, coal company would build these little tiny houses and with a store at the end, which they ran. Um, and it was a pretty modest, sometimes impoverished existence and that's where she grew up and the movement flowers came from barb
As I was talking to her, first of all, it, it, it's a pretty dark subject. You know, most of the books I read were about cave-ins, flood-ins, disaster, and just black lung disease, all the difficulties of that of that work environment. Um, but she was super sunny, <laughs> just very sunny as she talked about picnics and, you know, um, family events. And she said, oh, and she said, we all had flowers. And so this image of the women, particularly women were gardening, decorating these small houses with gardens was just so magical to me. And I thought, oh, we're really going to need those flowers because <laughs> there's a lot of coal and coal dust here. Let's have some flowers in this piece. And that came from literally her just leaning over and saying, I have a few stories to tell you. Um, again, being open, um, you know, not just saying, I don't know who this lady is behind the cash register, but going, oh, you do, you know, and actually listening. And um, and anyway, it's, it's, it was wonderful. I mean, she came to a few performances and, you know, just uh, that's a whole other side of it. But but just going in and, and, and recording what people had experienced was. So this, this piece is kind of both on a concrete level as you say is at some point in some interview you say the fuel of the nation it sort of it fuels the nation and we still depend on coal more than any other energy so it's really very real material but then you're also going into a history that has not really been told you or your interest in labor histories and people's stories that have been forgotten and i think the tunnels also there's something very primal for us to go into the earth literally people going deep in and extracting something which now we would frame maybe very quickly through global warming or these things, but what you're interested in is getting to a personal history that lives in people and their bodies and their memories, but isn't maybe the official history or quite the official history. Yeah, I mean, you know, a number of people have written written about it, but it's just not mainstream history. I certainly didn't learn in high school. Right. You know, I didn't learn about coal mining. Um, so it's... And I didn't really learn about labor history. I'm, you know, it might have been glossed over. Maybe I didn't notice it, but it certainly wasn't the main focus. You learn about presidents. You learn about war. Um, you don't necessarily, depending on what high school you went to, I guess you don't necessarily learn about labor history. So, uh, while it certainly is well studied, there may, many labor historians um, out there. Uh, I think for the general public, it's it's not necessarily uh, general knowledge. So, so that was interesting to me to uncover that. Um, and so many things might have been known in the day, but were forgotten. So one thing that I was really fascinated by was, um, were, well, were the speeches of John L. Lewis. So John L. Lewis was the head of the United Mine Workers Union, really fiery guy. Actually, these speeches are on YouTube. You can go on YouTube and see him see. talking to some congressional committee or something like that. And he's very kind of like Orson Welles, you know, he's got these thick eyebrows and he's, He's like, if we must grind up human flesh and bones in this industrial machine that we call modern America. Is it any wonder that there's lamentations in the mining towns of this country? Is it any wonder that there's a spirit of rebellion against this condition manifested now? by the memorial services and the prayer to high heaven that's going up from every mining community. And everybody's like, you can actually, in one of them, you can actually see the stenographer. She's kind of like, <laughs> you know, yikes, you know. Um, he was tough as nails and, you know, saying, saying it like it was, you know, these people are putting their lives on the line and we're all living in comfort. And so these ideas are so um, fascinating to me, but also so, relevant today you know that um how people are treated in workplaces you know it's 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 a timeless unfortunately a timeless subject so um anyway i guess there's there's the purpose is a story and it connects to your own story you said you grew up around there actually i thought about this after listening which is strange both my great grandfather and my grandfather who i never met who i never knew at all they were both mining directors and my mother is named barbara because Saint Barbara is the saint who protects people who are working underground. She was named. Oh, wow. She was named, and so we, we have a little statue of uh, Saint Barbara and my my mom because it, and I have this kind of weird chandelier 
which is kind of strange, which has two miners with hammers and everything. So, and oh, isn't it amazing? It, yeah, it's very strange. They were engineers, and I, I never knew them at all. But so this is. But I wanted to ask you about this, these stories to excavate these stories about workers and the other uh, piece we'll talk about in a little bit. Y there is a section in this which I found incredibly moving, where you have the chorus, and there's a large chorus of people reciting the names of miners who. And can you say something about that? It was just, it's, it actually yeah. made me cry. Well, uh, I, it made me cry too. <laughs> I, I, I even, before, before I said it, even. Yeah. There's something very magical about setting names, mm -hmm. you know, and, and so I found this, and I was so open to finding whatever information, you know, it could be a, 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 an advertisement, it could be a, a, a document of some kind. So I found this list that was, an accident mining list in index and it, it was so long i couldn't possibly set all the names it, 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 they, it wasn't the list of people who had died in the mine but they had somehow been injured in the mine and so um you know from a to z hundreds dozens uh, so many names so i thought okay well what am i gonna what am i gonna do i really like these names and they're they're so many of the names are so beautiful also because they are expressing or, or communicating where they're from, um, especially the Italian names, these multi-syllabic Italian names are so beautiful. So I started off by just narrowing it down to the Johns and Franks and some other one-syllable name. Um, and then I narrowed that to one-syllable last names. And in the end, I just did the Johns. So just, and John is like kind of a, a term for the everyday person, you know, John Doe. Um, so the Johns with one syllable last names in alphabetical order. So there is every John with a one syllable name that's on that index is in, is in this piece. And so first this is sort of in a way a little bit anonymous because John Ayers, John Baines, John Bates, you know, it's just John, John, John. Um, and there's almost like a, a rhythm to that because it's just one, you know, bum, 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 bum. So we go through this whole long list and then the piece has other text that has to do with coal, how coal is formed, you know, that it's from vegetation, leaves and branches. And then at the end, we return back to the names. And these were just my favorite names, I, names that I just thought were so musical. Massimino, Santirelli, Nicholas Scalgo, Scalgo Edward Scutulis. They just kind of had this song. And when I got to that point in so many rehearsals, it's been done now by a number of choirs, I always say to the choir, no, you're not just singing names, this is somebody's uncle, somebody's brother, somebody's father, you know, it's a, they're, it's not a cold list, it's a, it's a personal list. So that's a kind of fun and interesting way to think about text, that it's personal as opposed to um, just a list. So the names, I also have a real soft spot for the names. <laughs> but I was really thinking about why they affected me so much, and there was a, I think, they, be, they start to have a rhythm. And then you know they're coal mines where the human body is put in the service of this bigger machine, as this labor organizer says. There's a certain kind of strictness, but then within the rhythm, also to, to say someone's name is kind of to give breath to that life again. And some ways, I think it was really moving. You kind of felt, okay, all these people who probably were even buried alive in some mining accident or something horrible. They've, they're not forgotten, but they come alive. So I was thinking about music. Yeah. They were sort of there in that space. I could hear them. And I really thought it was very sort of this between prayer, this incantation and the rhythm of the piece, which also has the kind of industrial rhythm. Right, yeah. So it was this strange how the human being is sort of put into these rhythms, but we also create our own rhythms with our bodies. Yeah, no, no, it's really appreciate how you how you heard it because it is um it, i i was definitely thinking about a kind of incantation in the beginning because that's the that's the start of that piece and i thought how do i start this whole subject <laughs> and just to start with something that is almost like an incantation one really fun just 
side story about the names is that um, I was in Los Angeles. Actually, it's interesting you told me that you have this family connection because almost every time the piece has been performed, and I, it's, I don't know how many times it's been performed now, but a number of times, someone comes up to me and tells me their story. Interesting. And it, it can be, um, my father was one of many children and he lost this number of people in the minds. You know, whatever the story is, it's, it's always moving. Um, but we were, we were, had the pieces being performed in Los Angeles at uh, the beautiful hall there and Disney hall. And, um, I thought, well, it's not going to happen. Probably won't happen in Los Angeles. There's no coal mining around here. You know, I guess there was <laughs> further North there's gold, gold mining or something like that, but I didn't anticipate it. But after that concert, a woman came up to me afterwards and, um, said, my grandfather's on your list. And I, I said, what? What's his name? Like, who's your grandfather? And she said, John Coyne. He lived in that area. It was an unusual spelling. It was C-O-Y-N-E. And it just gave me the chills because that really brought it alive. Here she said, I, I know. He grew up there. He worked there. And so that John Coyne is my grandfather. So, you know, there are many, many stories of having communication with people who responded to the piece or have some connection to this in their family. Um, but that one name that was, uh, you know, I'll never forget that. It's, I, it's really um, powerful how you create this um, kind of atmosphere or sound world and, there, and this mix in these pieces between industrial sound, which in some ways in strictly classical music is excluded at all costs. Like the worst thing is that the heater banging or something, or, <laughs> or you want to have absolute silence to then create the world. But in some ways, I think to bring in these sounds, which it's also maybe very American in a way because this is an industrial nation. So I, that I thought was really powerful that to bring these sounds in. And I, and I wonder how you can, can say a little bit about this, how the orchestra is yeah. or the musicians. <laughs> well, it's great to talk about the music. I know it's the story and the history is so fascinating. Sometimes I forget to talk about the music, but, but it is such an important part of telling the story. And the, so the ensemble is, is the, my home band, the Bang and Akin All-Stars. So they come out of the festival. They've, been an ensemble for gosh, 20 something years, maybe close to 30 years now. Um, and um, super versatile musicians. They they are classically trained, so they can read down anything, but um, at the same time, they have this kind of body energy that's more connected to pop music. Um, you know, like Mark Stewart, who's the guitarist in the group, he plays with Bang in a Can, but he also was Paul Simon's music director, so was on tour with Paul Simon. So, you know, they live these sort of very rich musical lives of playing different kinds of music. So I work a lot with Mark, and we got together for this opening movement, and I was like, um, I need a sound that reflects the depth of the minds, Mark. How, how are we going to do this? And, and so he, he pulled out a whisk, a kitchen whisk. He's a very... Uh, you know, inventive guy. He's often building instruments out of all kinds of materials. So he pulled out a kitchen whisk and he put out a lot of reverb on the guitar and he started to scrub. So oh, something like this, you know, and he got this like, uh, you know, it's this, because you can strum a guitar, you can use a pick, you can use your hands. Um, I think people use other kinds of implements, but a kitchen whisk, hadn't thought of it. A kitchen whisk, I guess, is that kind of wrapped wire on the bottom. So, and I was like, that's it. That's, that's the reverberation. You know, and again, that's metaphorical. That is that what a, a, a what a cave or what a you know a, a coal mine sounds like? Well, I don't know. You know what coal mine sounds like? It sounds different to everybody. But to start to get a low, deep resonance that is somehow um, has a visual, you know, uh, imagination that goes with it. Um, was really interesting. You know, you look at the double bass and the very lowest string of the double bass, you press deep down on that, and you get this kind of rich, gritty sort of sound, lots of overtones, um, the bottom of the bass clarinet. So I was definitely looking at the low end of these instruments and thinking about how to get a kind of resonance. And um, these guys are great. They're, they're, you know, my favorite people to collaborate with. So I I can work with them in this way. They They have input. But when you're creating music, you don't see this, um, the parameters that traditional sort of composers see, like this is the end of that instrument. You don't take a kitchen whisk to your guitar. And so you do, you're like, this is, I want to create this and this is what I want to hear. So you 
It yeah. seems to be very open to say, okay, yeah. this, this could work, right? It's a kind of resourceful. Yeah, I mean, and there's this whole tradition, I guess it's tradition is a funny word to say, of extended technique, which means, I mean, it's like, particularly in Europe, um, where people are exploring instruments and trying to get all kinds of sounds. I mean, the, maybe the one difference is I, I use it in a very utilitarian way. So if I'm using an extended technique, there's often a, an extra musical reason why. So, mm -hmm. and, and that is helpful when you're stepping into something like an orchestra, because orchestras tend to live mostly in older repertoire and tradition. They play, you know, New York Philharmonic plays new pieces, but they're seasoned and trained in this tradition. And so when you tell them to take their bow and go, uh, you know, eh, there's got to be a reason why. I mean, they're they're open. They they play all kinds of music. But if they know that when they press down on that bow to make a scratch kind of sound, um, actually it makes it more like a clicking sound, I want it to sound like hundreds of sewing machines going at the same time. So they they see that, not that you have to have a reason to make a sound, but they can see the context of why I'm evoking these um, atmospheres and, and creating these sounds and asking them to do something, like you're saying, outside the traditional technique. Well, Julia, you're gregarious kind of infectious person, which probably helps, but how do they actually respond to this? Because there are reasons why the music and the orchestration grew up in this way. It wasn't just to confine people, but in some ways, like how do they how do they actually deal with that? Well, use the well, you know, everyone's different. I mean, like like when I'm working with the bang and the canalsters, they're super game. They're like, yeah. Yeah, let me show you the weirdest sound I can make. Um, and then they like playing beautiful melodies as well. But but they're completely open. Um, when you're stepping into a large uh, professional orchestra like the New York Philharmonic, well, it's terrifying. I was terrified to walk in. Oh, really? Um, oh, yeah. Uh, I, had to, I didn't know the conductor before. I don't, I, I haven't lived the mainstay of my life in that world. I mean, I have written orchestra pieces um, periodically throughout my time of writing music, um, but you, no one would have, especially a few years ago, I don't think anyone would say, oh, yeah, Julia, well, she's an orchestra composer. They wouldn't say that because I write for nine bagpipes or I write for electric guitars or, you know, and strings, you know, I, I do a lot of different things, but suddenly I'm more recently living in this orchestra world. And so to walk in there, um, oh yeah, I was like, I don't know if I slept the whole week before I had to <laughs> go in. Um, but I carefully worked out what I was going to give them. Like there's no time to experiment in those contexts. It's first of all, everyone's it's union, you know, they, they are protected, which is very important. You know, they have a certain amount of rehearsal time. It's limited. It has to be very, very efficient, loud, soft, whatever you're asking for. Boom. You got to just tell them right there. You can't go, let me think about that. There's no time to let me think about that when you're in that context. So I did meet with a string player, um, not from the orchestra, but just someone I worked with a lot. Um, Chris Otto, is, he's in the Jack Quartet. And I said, Chris, come over here. I want you to just show me these various things that you've experimented with. I want to kind of hunt and gather. And then I refine what those things are. So when I go in there, I know what I'm asking for. I'm not just like randomly throwing something at them. And um, and they're, they're a game. You know, I think that, again, I think the narrative helps. So once we're in the room and they understand what I'm, what the whole subject is and what the meaning is, they know it's got to be, <sighs> You know, they know they need that. Um, there was one fun moment where I have, now other composers have used this before, but I, I had them lift their bows in the air and and whip the bow in the air. So they go like, <laughs> so the beginning of the last movement, if you heard like, <laughs> that's what that is. Well, those bows are really super expensive. I mean, everyone knows the cello is expensive, the violin is expensive, especially on that level. These players are buying very expensive instruments. Um, they don't necessarily want to go with that boat. So they didn't. At first it was like, you know, and I said to the conductor, um, actually it's not, it's, you know, and I had to like make the sound and, and he said, okay. Um, and he was great to work with actually, super respectful. It was a very positive experience with, for, with the Alphonse Wade. And, and he said, okay, I'll give him that note. And I said, well, actually, Give him that note means I'll give him that note, but we don't need to, we need to move on. And I said, actually, I really want to hear that. And it's the only time I stopped him and said, 
I have to hear that right now, you know. And he and he said, okay, so, well, you know, and he was definitely communicating to me, you know, those bows are very expensive. Because, so, you know, in other words, you don't want to go like this and hit a music stand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they they bring an extra bow with them, so they have their super nice bow. You still want them to destroy them. For this part. And then they take out the other bow and they go like this, you know. Um, but then they did it, you know. I, I said, cause, because what it is, it's almost like a exaggerated um, striking of a match. Because, of course, we're talking about the fire in the last movement. So it's like, you know, what what what's happened? How did that fire start? They're not even quite sure how that fire started. And I just thought that sound with all the strings doing it was going to be beautiful. And it was a great. They did a great, and a great, you know. Did they, did they understand this is what that movement is going to be about? Did they get yeah. Them? This is kind of the climax. But before we go a little bit more into the piece, when you walk in and you're nervous and you don't quite know, because I'm really interested in this, because you're coming in and you're also, you're, you're standing next to Mozart and Shostakovich and Beethoven, all the other composers, but there's <laughs> Julia Wolf. You're like, oh, this is my piece, piece do your best. So how do you get over thinking I'm presenting myself and my work, I'm totally exposed with these people who are professionals, who are, who are gonna, also say, is this really going to be the level we, is this, so how do you get over being in this space where really they haven't really been exposed to someone like you who's been doing Well, this? they have actually. So, so the Philharmonic does play new pieces, new um, pieces. as well as other orchestras, LA Phil. They and, haven't used their bow like this. Let's say that. They um, have, I don't know if they've done that. <laughs> um, but they have done some unusual things in the past. Do they love doing it? That's another question. I don't know. You yeah. know, um, yeah. But How do you feel as a person once you, right, that's you, what you're you have to exhale afterwards? You're like, okay, this went fine. <laughs> um, well, the one thing is I don't think too much about all of those great <laughs> composers that came before. I, I, I love that. I mean, I'm especially like a Beethoven nut. I love Beethoven. And, I'm sorry, you know, I put that in your head now. Yeah. Late, no, late string quartets. I, I, I love that music. And so... I, but I don't, I don't necessarily think too much about it because if I did, I wouldn't get out of bed in the morning. I mean, if I, even like what a lot of people say, oh, it's so hard to write a string quartet. There's such a long history. I like, I'm not thinking about it. I mean, not, it's not like I'm not referencing it or, or even affected by it. I'm certainly influenced by it in some way. Um, but I'm not, um, if you think about it too much, you just, again, and in a way that's might be a little bit of an American phenomenon too, that we don't have this we're sort of renegades and, and not everyone obviously but but there's we don't have this for better and worse but we don't have this weight of history on us we're kind of like it's the wild west we're just going out there and you know um there's a little bit of a sense that um you can go out and do it why not you know um and that's a real generalization because there are great experimentalists all through europe that have broken ground and that are I certainly influenced me tremendously um Composers like Louis Andreessen, or it really it broke interesting ground. Um, but I think there's a little bit of uh, I'm accustomed to being a rebel or being irreverent. And um, but nonetheless, you know, you want to do something great. You know, you want to why bother being there? You know, if you try not to do something, try to do something great. So um, you kind of have to pretend a little bit. You're not going to go to swallow and then just be present and um, uh, be patient. Um, and try to be simple in a way, um, not try and try not to panic. There were a lot of technical challenges with that piece because I was asking for very unusual things from an orchestra, not necessarily the musical things, but um, normally a, a, an orchestra is set up on the stage and the choir is in the back. And I asked them, I said, you know, I need the choir to come forward because when they, when those women in the choir are going to sing the movement that's protest, they've got to be right in your face. So everybody's like, how are we going to do that? How are they going to see the conductor? Because they come on the other side of the conductor. So I don't know what I was thinking, but, and I said, no, I know they have to be together. The music has to be, can't have a train wreck. The music has to be together. But the difference between them being in the back and them coming right up front and saying, I want to, you know, I mean, that's huge. And they got that and they said, okay, well, let's figure out how we're going to do that. Mm -hmm. And I guess I convinced them in, in one of the meetings. Um, and so what we had in that piece, we, we, th we tried a couple of things. We tried having conductors uh, that were in the, that were mirroring the main conductor. Yeah. But in the end, we actually had the conductor on a screen 
speaking of screens, um, in the back of the hall. So and there was always a be them. So if you're watching the piece, you see the conductor, you see the singers. But if you turned around like this, you'd see him on a screen. And that's what the singers were able to see. It was nerve wracking until it all got set up because can there be a delay? You know, this whole issue of Zoom has a delay. That has a tiny, tiny bit of delay as well. But it was it was so minuscule that it worked Amazing. and they could make it work. But these are the kinds of things that are a little bit of an unusual ask in an, in an orchestra setup. I'm going to ask you one more thing. You said you walk in, you explain it, and you want to be simple. What do you mean? You kind of don't want to make it too comp. You wanted to get it and say, let's um, play this. No, by simple, I don't necessarily mean the music. Um, no, no, it'd be, uh, but, uh, yeah. But I mean, um, I guess in a certain sense, be clear. Okay. Um, yeah. You can't. Um, well, you can't hesitate too much. I mean, I I do hesitate at times when I'm trying to think of an answer, but yeah, yeah it's very um, big strokes. Is it loud? Is it quiet? Is it, um, you know, driving or you, you kind of have to choose your issues and then just go with that and not, um, you can't wax philosophical in the middle of an orchestra right. concert. <laughs> at least, at least here. We are already talking about fire in my mouth. So this is about the triangle shirtwaist fire, which killed 146 workers. Actually a year uh, in 1911, in March, which is now an NYU building at New York University in Greenwich Village. So it's actually commemorated every year by labor unions and city officials that they put 146 carnations out there. And I think every NYU person in the village knows about this because you notice on that day, this is where a lot of young women and girls jumped to their death because they were trapped in a sweatshop where they had to produce clothing. So yeah. this is what you took as the, the start. and. To maybe start right there, um, it's a piece about women. It's a piece about labor rights, about women's rights. You have other pieces about equality, um, her story or spinning. You said you you referred them somewhere as your feminist manifesto, mink stole spinning, which I like. But as a woman composer, also you're walking into spaces also that are not that people are not so completely familiar with that they see a woman composer because they're not as many as we would like. Yeah, and and that's. That's changed. Um, it's very different than when I started. Um, it hasn't changed completely, um, but the next generation is so different. And it's funny, I was just talking to Joan Tower the other day. She's in her 80s and she shakes her head sometimes when I have these conversations. She says, oh, you have no idea what it was like. She was, you know, and I have so much respect for the women of that generation in their 70s and 80s that, you know, got out the machete and had to really carve a path. There really was no, there were so few role models and so little precedent. So very hard in that generation. In my generation, I have very active peers. Um, uh, you know, people are doing great work and they're, they're being supported. The next generation, a, a real abundance of women. So I think it's definitely changed, you know, sort of the way medicine has changed although I think medicine has changed quicker now apparently there are more women in medicine than men even and so uh we're a little behind the doctors <laughs> but um so there has been a huge change and and there are many many great examples of, of women composing uh, but nonetheless it the tradition you're right the history is not there um the way it is with a performer or, or with a writer or with a um you know a painter even there were more women so the idea of thinking of yourself as a creator mm -hmm. in music um, is, is, as a woman, is relatively new. Mm -hmm. And um, I think I probably, in some ways, was just naive enough to think I could do it. Um, and I also came a little bit from outside the tradition. So I'm not, you know, I spent a lot of time with American folk music and I was in theater. Um, and a lot of women who have made their mark, I guess I'd say, came from the outside a little bit. I would say there, there are some people who were more traditional, like the child prodigy pianist or something like that. And then they started composing. But a lot of women in, in this, my generation and older uh, might have come from the outside because if you were on the inside, maybe you were told, uh, play some nice piano in the parlor. That's wonderful. And let's stop there. You know, um, I didn't, I didn't have those messages. So I think in certain sense that's liberating, yeah. um, but um, yeah. 
summer institute or a summer program also where you're creating is you you have a summer program or institute or where um, you're yeah creating uh, this this context for people who didn't which maybe you didn't even quite have right yeah and that's that's um oh, well it's a fun uh, summer institute it's up at mass mocha we do it every summer and which is in northwestern massachusetts and um the idea for that is more just a, a real home for new ideas in music. So a lot of times there are many wonderful festivals, you know, this Tanglewood and Aspen. Um, but uh, we felt many of us have attended those festivals, but music, new music was a little bit more on the side. So the mainstay again is the traditional music. Um, so we just thought, let's make a festival that's just about new ideas and new music. So the Summer Institute brings together composers, young composers, or young, you know, usually in early part of their career, maybe their late 20s, early 30s, um, performers and composers come together and um, it's uh, yeah, a wonderful immersion for just about, about a month that we gather there. And if we can go back to Fire in My Mouth, so this is, um, it's a political piece, it's a really gorgeous piece of music and in some ways you said a lot of your work is driven by stories and to actually sort of tell a story but I think there are moments when you allow the listeners to just kind of fall into this terrifying experience of what these women actually and what conditions they were in so there's both the story and then the part of the story that doesn't become a story it's just kind of an experience that doesn't and, and as we know, you had some oral histories and you used songs that were there, but then you also, I think, wanted to create the situation they were in. And I would, can you say a little bit about the, also the, they are also the use of industrial noise or the sewing machine, what you said, the, 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 what you tried to create in the beginning? Yeah, I really wanted to evoke um, the, some of the sound worlds. And I, I actually, I, I love doing that. I love, actually, funny enough, I should say that because I think my scissors are somewhere right around here. Really? I'll, I'll have to find them. But, uh, you know, some very literal things like all the singers had these large scissors. Um, I went on a scissor search. And I so- remember, I remember you mentioned this to me yeah. for some reason at some point. You were going to, and you went to the garment district or something. I remember. Yeah. You were, you were actually looking for scissors that make certain sounds. And these were the winners. Um, these are the Wiss. Um, and they're just wonderful. So, I, I, you know, that's just fun to suddenly have that be a part of the sound world. And um, there are different things. There are, um, in the last movement, there are kind of bells that toll. There are actually chimes that, you know, percussionists use. And they did ring bells for the for the women who perished at you know at that time and as part of a memorial. Um, a lot of little literal references. I mean, the one thing I should say is that um, the hardest thing to set was the last movement because the piece is really about these women and it's about their fight to for better working conditions, right? So that's I wanted it to be about them. I didn't want it to be about them as victims, but them more as activists. So the two thirds of the piece, you've got them as activists and thinking about their lives and how they came here. And I guess, you know, mostly we're mostly immigrant. There were men in the factory too, but primarily young immigrant women. So two thirds of the piece is about that. Then I get to the fire and I'm like, oh my God, how am I going to set the fire? You know, it's a, it's a tragedy. It's, you don't want to sentimental be too sentimental about it you don't want to trivialize it you don't want to over romanticize it it's just a horrifying event i think it was something like in 18 seconds they they right. burned you know so flame went up how do you capture that well i i used the least text in the moment where i was depicting the fire and i just thought i have to make the orchestra really loud so it's just like you know, it's just the brass, everybody's in and just screaming almost. And and I just had the voices do something really simple. Um, they just say, I see them falling. And they say that with like, I see them. They kind of slide down, what we call music, glissando, falling, you know, and they just say this simple thing over this kind of sound. Um, it was just a challenge to to get to a point where I felt comfortable with how it was represented, mm -hmm. because it's 
gruesome. And mm -hmm. I didn't want to, I wanted to have a certain kind of respect for the, for the dead. I mean, there were, you know, there were images that we didn't use. And actually I said that specifically to Jeff, oh, I should mention Jeff Sugg, who's a beautiful um, videographer, scenic videographer, um, who made all the visuals that go with this piece. And it's, it's not the piece without what he does. He, he worked also on anthracite fields. But I said to him, let's not have any burnt body. I don't want to see any broken bodies on the ground. Of course, there were. And, you, and if you go online, you just look up Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire, you'll see these photographs that are very important. But I somehow mm -hmm. didn't want it to be so uh, graphic. I wanted to just you to know how horrible it was, but not drag you through every every inch of it so um so that was that was a hard thing but as you're saying like I, I, it's creating the 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 image of it or the sensation of it um in some artistic way um but that was the hardest it kind of gave me a pause to figure out how to capture that and what do you think um do you have any sense of what your audience how do you think they've they, how are they afterwards, do you think? Do you have any idea? I mean, it's not like that you want them to feel or have seen something or heard something, but what do you think? Because I felt really kind of speechless. Um, it sort of well, takes your breath away in a way. You sort of, you are in this space and then you sort of, there's a kind of excitement and there's protests and there are these voices and these women who speak out and then the piece ends in this kind of really dramatic finale, but then you kind of, you don't quite know, I think, and it's, you know, we want art to do something about these terrible things in the world. Like, I think we hope that it's not exactly catharsis, not exactly solace, not exactly we know, no, but it, it, it still does something with that experience of loss. Yeah, and it's, it's interesting what, music's role can be, you know, um, it's not the same as, I mean, I'm, yeah, I'm a very conscious person, but it's not the same as great activists change, making change. But I, I do think it communicates. Um, I think it's important, you know, as everyone always says, to re, to to re understand history. Because yeah. if you understand history, then, well, we always do repeat ourselves. But maybe there's some consciousness and some evolution towards a better sense of humanity. Um, and so, if you're kind of sharing how, I mean, basically the piece is sharing how, how I felt, you know, I mean, I was like, oh my God, you know, I mean, you, you, if I'm feeling that, I want to share that and say, can, I can't believe we let this happen. And that's how the city felt at the time. Like they're beautiful. I didn't really get into this, but they're, by beautiful, I just mean poignant, but um, photographs of the entire city was mourned. This, this is like New York City. Mm -hmm. Day after the fire, or I can't remember when the actual the, the funeral march was, but you these hordes of people, tons of people went into the streets and they mourned this loss. You know, in a way, I don't even know if we mourn this way now, but it was just a huge outcry, and everyone knew that they had been let down. You know, it was okay. Yeah very bad factory owners, you know, not putting into safety code, but it's more than that. It's, it's having safety code, it's having fire code, it's having labor laws, you know, and we're all a part of that. And I guess my emotional feeling about it was, um, how can we do this? You know? And so I, I, I'm expressing that in the music, like it's my, like, what, how, how, you know? Um, so, Everybody reacts differently. I mean, there was, I mean, not to like toot my horn or something, but there was a real, really strong reaction. The piece ended yeah. and the whole place stood up. Yeah. And it was really, I was just taken aback by that because I it, it, I, I felt like I reached them. You know, that I'm not, I'm just going to reach everybody everywhere all the time, but there, I, I, there was a, an audience like lift up. And it happened every night. So I hope I get to do it again. We did it, you know, this one run. Um, but I, I, you know, I don't know if partly it's, I think it's a New York story, but I think it's also just a story. Um, oh, you know, I, 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 I teach the story because we both teach at New York University. So it happened in one of the buildings. And then in 2013 in Bangladesh, the Rana factory collapsed. And this is where they make fast fashion, which 
all of us consume. So all the clothes that are made, and then some of those companies moved out of that, they moved right back in. So H&M, Adidas, Nike, they all produce things there that all of us consume. So my students, in some ways, what you just said, that the audience felt something collectively. I think that's quite important, that we feel something as a connected group rather than in isolation. And my students, I make them think about, okay, we outsource this, but these things still happen a hundred years later, they're just not on our continent, but that doesn't mean. So I think by you, by bringing this work back to New York, it's not New York, we solved these problems, we're done. We are still consuming fashion. We're not done, I <laughs> know. We're not done, exactly, yeah, yeah. But I think also partly what, that it's, a, it's a, an audience, it's as a collective, you experience something. I think that's quite important that you think other people around me maybe also feel this is wrong because that's maybe the beginning of a movement or of what you're saying activism is that actually if, you, if you're sitting in a, in a theater and thinking, I feel really touched by this, the other people feel too, maybe we could do something together. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to know, uh, you know, the, yeah. how music translates into that. I think it can. And, yeah. um, but I probably need, like, I mean, the education of it and my own education, learning more in depth about it, um, showing it in this emotional way, because I think in a way it's kind of an emotional mm. telling of, of, of a history. Um, and then we need those people to go out and, you know, yeah. we, need, we need boycotts and we need like with all those other functional things that actually, right. you know, uh, a lot of um, people dedicate their lives to it's such an important part of it. So I hope, I hope this is a kind of yeah awareness and, you know, and even if it translates into other settings that it, there's a kind of awareness and understanding. Yeah. And I also think, I think there's sort of, people do different things. I think symbolic change is vitally important. And I think for you to focus on these were 146 women and girls really in, in the anthracite fields, the Louis Hine pictures you show, these were boys working, that there were no labor laws. So they are 12, 14 year old boys who are in the coal mines. And you look at these pictures and you're thinking, wait, 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 they cannot send these little boys into the coal mine with these big gloves. So, the one thing I also thought, the history, we will forget it again, unless people like you put it back on stage. Because history is just going to just be disappeared again. Yeah, I mean, it is good to remember. And also, um, for me, it was sort of an elimination. Sometimes we think, oh, we're, we're so progressive today, you know. Um, and I think there is some evolution and things have changed and some many things haven't changed, but many things have improved and certainly uh, safety things have improved but um let's see what i was going to say about that um i lost my okay. train of thought but um we think we've improved in a way oh but yes that's what it was um but it's also so remarkable who these early women were i, I didn't know a lot about them so when i started to read about clara lemlick and understand how bold she was, you know, she, she <laughs> comes here, she doesn't speak the language, she's self-educated yes. and she stands up and goes to the front of the room in front of when the workers were kind of debating, should they strike all the garment workers? Should, should they strike? Should they not strike? And she's like, we have to strike. What are you talking about? I mean, she said it in her own words, but who was this person, you know? And so you think you're progressive now, but they were pretty darn progressive then. And she's coming here from, I think she's from Russia, Eastern Europe, Russia. Um, so she's coming from a culture of where obviously these ideas are were beginning, you know, this idea of, of revolution or, um, so she's, she's armed with some of that, but then she's, you know, newly on these shores and she starts to, to fight. And I just think, well, I don't know if we're like her, you know, she's ahead of the, ahead of the curve and ahead of the times. <laughs> But don't you think young people today are also the driving force? And in some ways, I think what we've seen in the last year, I think all the global movements around Black Lives Matter, I think yeah. the global movements around climate, it's its driven by young people. It yeah, really I think that's, that's true. There's and a boldness, people. yes. And, and that comes with um, not being, you know, strapped down and, and going out and it, no, I think it's definitely true that the, it begins there. Oh, that's ideally where you begin as a young person to kind of imagine something that everyone better that all these older people have messed up. And right, right, yeah. right. 
Julie, I'm going to ask you two uh, personal questions at the end. The first one is, what kind of music do you listen to when you're not listening to your own music? Oh my gosh. Well, you know, sometimes when I'm writing a piece, I, I, um, I, I, I try not to listen too much, you know, um, because, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. you kind of have this other music in your head, but I listen to everything. I mean, I listen to fiddlers, um, some favorite fiddlers. I love Bruce Malski is like an amazing fiddler. Um, uh, I listen to, well, I teach, so I listen to all my students' works, and I'm always listening also to um, uh, Michael and Michael Gordon, David Lang, are my co-partners in Bang in a Can, so what they're working on, sometimes in the middle of when they're working, um, my colleagues at NYU, you know, are just, there's, there's um, yeah, but what else do I listen to? I listened when to you're, when you're Beyonce the-, the other day, I had Beyonce, because I wanted to just kind of see what her latest, you know, so it's pretty open, you know, it's, I don't really have one genre that I listen to. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But that actually shows in your work, I think, how you, you, you're able to pull from all these different things. And the second question is I have, um, who do you think we should interview for, or have a conversation with for this series? Do you have any ideas, anybody else um, who you think has been inspiring in their field or interesting? Or could um, be any, it, doesn't well, have, it doesn't have to be a famous person. It can be anybody who would be interesting who... <laughs> Well, one person who I adore, and you might have already talked with her, um, and who I worked with many years ago, is Anna Devere Smith. Oh, if you can catch Anna, she's always busy on the run, but, but was, she's she's fantastic, and I feel hugely influenced by her by her work. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I would say. So I have I've had the great pleasure. I interviewed Anna because I run a di- different podcast called the Proust oh, there, where we do 35 questions and where I, she was, and it was one of the most moving experiences. And Anna, as you know, she teaches and she has these eight hour classes and she did it before class and it was the intensity of her. But I think for this series or Paradigm Shifters for Skirball, I think Anna would be a great person to talk to. And you've collaborated with her, right, in the past. Um, yeah, years ago I did, well, actually I was just on a stage with her um, because uh, right before COVID, we did a. Um, she was doing a presentation at uh, the Cranert Center, which is out in Champaign Urbana, and they they were trying to think of well, who come talk to Anna. We have like little stage conversations. Let's invite Julia. I don't even know if they knew I knew her when they invited me, but um, I was like Anna, I'm totally down. Fly me out there. So I went out. It's like one of the last flights I took, I think. Um, and we sat and had a talk and. Yeah, there's so many things that she said to me that I remember. Um, I told her, I I don't know if you remember saying this, but I remember at one point, um, you know, how old was I? I was probably in my 30s. um, And I was feeling sort of cynical or just like politics, whatever, you know. And she looked at me and she was like, don't get cynical. You always have to, I don't remember what her exact words, but you, you always have to believe that you can make change and, and the way she said it to me, it was like, it hit me like a rock. And I was like, oh, right, I'm getting cynical. Because I was kind of like, whatever, let those politicians be stupid. You know, and I don't remember what I said, but it was definitely, I can't even think about it kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And here I was working with her, and her, all her work is so political, and I was so fascinated by her interviews. And um, and she she really affected me. That that one thing turned me kind of right. around. Yeah, it's great. And but so many things sustenance for the whole pandemic. That's good to do that right before. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so Julia, I really want to thank you. Uh, this has really been amazing. Oh, and thank I, you. I, thank you so much. I, I do want to say it and make the, the music, it's so moving. And in some ways for me, maybe this experience of walking through the city, which is in this kind of strange place. I don't think it's melancholic. Actually, I think the city doesn't quite know what it's doing right now, but to have your music uh, around is really an amazing, it was, it's an amazing okay. experience. Well, thank you for listening. Yeah, really. Oh yeah, absolutely. I'm going to, I'm going to use um, the piece uh, fire in my mouth when I teach the garment factory, sort of these dual events in New York and then in Bangladesh next week. <laughs> Fantastic. Great. All right. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. Okay. Talk thank to you. Bye-bye. Bye.